Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to another true crime makeup video. Today, we are heading to Ireland for today's case. And today's case is the Scissor Sisters, uh, which has also been kind of dubbed as one of Ireland's most gruesome crimes in recent history. So, um, We've got a fun one today. Um, and I actually wanted to film this video weeks ago, like forever ago. Uh, you may have seen a comment from me like at the beginning of this year saying, oh, I'm working on an Irish case. It's coming very soon. Well, this is today's case. And the reason why it took me so long to film this video um, is because at the beginning of the year, I did like three female killers in a row. And then I was gonna do this one, like after those. And I was like, hang on a minute. I'm doing too many female killers at this point. I need to take a break. I need to step back from the female killers, do a few male killers and then revisit. So here we are, even though I'm really annoyed at myself, I should have really timed this better for St. Patrick's Day because this case actually takes place around St. Patrick's Day and that would have been really, really clever of me, wouldn't it? But um, I didn't. And just before we get on to today's video, I just want to thank you all so much for the response on last week's video, which was Nico Jenkins, because that case was a heavy case for starters, but that case was so difficult. Definitely the hardest case so far that I've done to research and compile into a story. It definitely took its toll. It was so frustrating and stressful at times, but I'm so happy that you all enjoyed it. And it just made all of that hard work worthwhile. So this case takes place in March of 2005. And I don't know why, I don't know if it's just the cases that I'm picking, but so many of them have happened in March. What is in the air in March? Now there are a few characters that I need to kind of do the background on. So I'm gonna try and do it in the least confusing way possible because I kind of have to just go through the background so you can kind of understand the story. So I'm going to start with Catherine Mulhall, which is like the mother of the family and she plays quite an important role. So we're gonna start with her. Now we don't know her exact age, which I found really weird. <laughs> Um, but she's in her early 50s around the time that this case takes place. And she is married to John Mulhall and together they have six children, two of which are the sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing you should know about Kathleen is that she uh, liked to drink. Now, I know <laughs> there's such a stereotype, isn't there? Uh, that Irish people like to drink. And I know it's just a stereotype, but this case... <laughs> Definitely plays into that stereotype a little bit. So yeah, Kathleen loved to drink and her husband, John, also liked to drink, uh, but he was very abusive, just very physically violent, just not the best husband. I couldn't find anywhere whether he was abusive to the children. I don't think he was. I think it was just Kathleen, but still that kind of environment isn't exactly the best for children. That is still extremely traumatic. Okay, so now getting on to um, the two sisters. Uh, we're going to start with Linda, who is the eldest of the two sisters. She was born in 1975, and around the time of the case, um, the offence, she was 30 years old. She had a history of alcohol abuse um, and just kind of taking different drugs and stuff. And at the time of the offence as well, she was addicted to heroin. And she left school pretty early, like she didn't really have any qualifications. She was currently unemployed. And she was actually convicted of theft when she was 18 years old, but she didn't go to prison. And I assume she just kind of got like some kind of community uh, punishment or something like that. She also had four children from a relationship and she was no longer with that man. So moving on to the younger sister, Charlotte Mulhall. She was born in 1983 and she was 21 years old at the time of the case. And she also had a little bit of a drinking problem. Um, she also had a history of drug abuse as well. And like her older sister, she did have a couple of convictions for criminal damage and public order offenses. But again, I don't think she went to prison. And at the time of the offense, she was currently working as a prostitute. Okay, so jumping back to Kathleen now, um, the mom. In the early 2000s, her marriage to John was kind of on the rocks. I mean, I imagine it was kind of on the rocks for a very long time. And they were kind Kind of living together but kind of not it was it was a very weird situation and then in 2002 Kathleen met a man called Farah Noor and Kathleen moves Farah into the family home while her husband is still living there so yeah that they're, they're not together they're still married clearly um, I don't really know it seems so weird but Kathleen moves her new boyfriend into the house and Johnny's kind of like 
uh, <laughs> what are you doing? So John moves out because he doesn't really want to live with his wife and her new boyfriend. Okay, so Kathleen's new boyfriend, Farah Noor, was originally born in Kenya in 1965. And then he moved to Ireland in 1996 when he was 31 years old. Now, when he arrived in Ireland, Farah actually said that he was from Somalia and he was fleeing the Somali civil war. And he claimed that his whole family died in the Somali civil war. And he was claiming to be a refugee of war, which is obviously not true because he was from Kenya. So I don't really know why he said that. Now, I really need to stress this, but Farah is not a nice person at all. He, ugh not a nice person okay he is an extremely violent man especially when he's taken drugs there are multiple accusations of assaults against women including sexual assault he actually has raped three women that we know of two of which were minors and one of those minors was also disabled and all three of the women that he raped fell pregnant from the rape he was also very abusive to kathleen some of that abuse was also sexual. So <laughs> yeah, I cannot stress this enough that he is not a nice person. And some of these offenses were reported to the police, but he never spent any time in prison. And it just frustrates the hell out of me how hard it is to convict anybody of rape. And I'm not really sure if Kathleen loved Farah or she just couldn't get away from the relationship because she was scared of him. And there's one incident that happened that has stuck with me, like from this case. She phoned one of Farah's exes. I don't really know why she phoned one of his exes, but she did. And the ex said, you've got to get out. You've got to leave him. Otherwise he'll kill you. So that's why I say like, I don't know if Kathleen loved Farah or she just felt trapped and scared and she couldn't get out. So it's now Sunday, the 20th of March, 2005. And St. Patrick's Day is the 17th of March. So it was the previous Thursday, but St. Patrick's Day is a pretty big deal, especially in Ireland, obviously. Uh, so the celebrations continue on for a few days. So everyone was still celebrating St. Patrick's Day on this Sunday. And in the morning of the Sunday, Charlotte and Linda are together and Charlotte is trying to convince Linda to have a drink, to carry on celebrating, to which Linda does agree. So they do start drinking and then they plan to meet up with Kathleen and Farah, I think. I don't know if they want to meet up with Farah, but Farah's just kind of with Kathleen. So Linda and Charlotte are drinking. They catch a bus into Dublin and they're just walking around having a good time and then they meet up with Kathleen. This is not important to the story, but I just think it's ridiculous now at this point. They meet up with Kathleen at McDonald's. <laughs> I swear, I don't know what it is. McDonald's comes up in so many of these crime videos now. So yeah, they meet up McDonald's. Bloody hell. And the four of them go to an off license to buy some alcohol because Farah apparently drinks spirits by the liter. I don't know how anyone could do that, but apparently Farah does, and it's too expensive to drink that much at a pub or a bar or anything like that. So they go to an off license to buy some vodka, and then they just head off on their merry way, just drinking, having fun, messing around around Dublin, and they make their way down to the pier. So whilst they are on the pier, Linda pulls out some ecstasy pills. She takes one, she also hands one to Charlotte and Kathleen sees them doing this and instead of being like horrified, she asks for one. And Farah to the relief, I assume anyway, of the three women declines one because he's very violent on drugs, which is why I say to the relief. Yeah, Farah is just quite content with just drinking his liters of vodka. So this is basically how they spend their day and it's starting to get dark now. So they wanna continue the party, have nowhere else to go. So they head back to Kathleen and Farah's flat. And on their walk back, Farah, as you can imagine, with the amount he has been drinking, is pretty drunk. And he sees this little five-year-old boy, which he's clearly not thinking straight. He runs up to this boy, grabs the boy, and starts saying, Kathleen, this is my son. This is my son. This is my son. And she's like, no, it's not. <laughs> Farah in his drunken state thinks that this five-year-old boy 
is one of the children that he fathered after he raped the child's mother. It's not, obviously. And Kathleen is getting so angry. She's like, no, he's not, you idiot. <laughs> I did not say that right at all. <laughs> idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry if any of you watching this are Irish. <laughs> Basically, she said, no, he's not, you idiot. <laughs> so Kathleen and Farah get into like an argument. They're creating a scene. Not that either one of them care, but they're creating a scene. Kathleen is like, put the boy down, you're scaring him. Um, and Farrah does eventually put him down, but Kathleen and Farrah continue on arguing. They continue on arguing the whole way back to the flat. And whilst Kathleen and Farrah are arguing, Linda and Charlotte are still with them, but they're just kind of like, what I assume they're not really paying attention to their mom and her boyfriend arguing. They're just kind of like, together having a good time you know so they arrive back at the flat Kathleen and Farrah are still like putting a damper on the uh, party spirit so Charlotte and Linda put on a Sean Paul album it's just those little facts for me that, that really stand out I don't know why when I read that I was like a Sean Paul album. it's like why does that even matter but it's things like that that actually stand out to me in cases so yeah they put on a Sean Paul album and uh, they get busy um, they get busy and dance. I don't know why I'm finding this so funny. This is not funny. This is true crime. And Farrah is just in a foul mood. So Kathleen decides that she wants to change that. And she crushes up one of the ecstasy pills and puts it in his drink. I don't know why she did this. We all know how violent Farrah gets, especially when he's on drugs. Uh, but she did it and it did seem to have some sort of effect on Farrah because he definitely cheered up if you want to say that. However, um, he starts to be very inappropriate towards Linda. He starts grabbing her. He tries to get her to sit on his lap. He's just being really inappropriate. He's being sexually suggestive. He's whispering things into her ear. She can't actually remember what he said, but like she just knows that it was inappropriate. And Linda is trying to get him to like move get your hands off me and charlotte kind of sees what's happening and she's like get your hands off my sister you know kathleen sees what's going on as well and she's like what are you doing farrah is just ignoring all three women he's just like i don't care what any of you are saying i want linda i mean i don't know if he said that but in his intentions he's kind of like i don't care what you're saying if i want something i'm gonna get it and then he says to linda you're a creature of the night just like your mom. Random thing to say to someone. Never actually heard anyone say that to anyone before. I think he's insinuating that Linda's a prostitute. I don't know. But this aggravates Kathleen because she's like, what? And you could say that this is what makes Kathleen really angry, which I'm sorry, this definitely portrays Catherine's personality. She gets more insulted when Farrah basically insults her and not when he's trying to you know, with her daughter. That right there sums Kathleen up, in my opinion. But anyway, Farrah doesn't like that Kathleen is getting a little bit more angry and he starts making like threatening hand gestures. He actually kind of does this, like insinuating that he's gonna like slit her throat or kill her or something. Kathleen and the two daughters like take him seriously and I, I, I don't blame them. He's a very violent man. And all the while this is happening, Linda is still trying to like get free of Farrah, but he's still got his hands on her. God knows what Farrah's intentions are. We all know what he's capable of and what he has done. So Charlotte goes into the kitchen she grabs a standing knife and returns and says to Farrah one last time, get your hands off my sister. He still ignores her, still doesn't let Linda go, to which Charlotte gets the knife and slashes Farrah's throat. Now, if you don't know what a standing knife is, it's basically a box cutter. You know, one of those knives that like is retractable, like it goes into the little thing. Um, so it's a very short blade, very sharp, but it's a very short blade. So Charlotte would have had to get quite close to Farrah when she did that. And it's nothing like what you see on TV or the movies. Blood wasn't like spurting everywhere. Farrah actually didn't know what was going on straight away. And he actually gets up. He finally lets Linda go and he's just like stumbling around. And it's at this point that Kathleen turns to her two daughters and says to them, kill him or he'll kill me. Now, obviously they're all intoxicated, extremely intoxicated, without a shadow of a doubt impairing their judgment 
on what was going on. But I just feel like Farah has just had his throat slit. Yes, he's not unconscious right now. He's still like stumbling about, but he's still being impeded, you know? Like <laughs> you can't just function normally when your throat has been slit, you know? I get that Farah is very violent and stuff, but at this particular moment, was Kathleen fearing for her life? I just don't know. And then I think, okay, maybe Kathleen isn't fearing her life right there and then in that moment, but maybe she thinks that the throat slit isn't like that deep, like it hasn't actually done any damage. It's just kind of bleeding a bit because he hasn't lost consciousness. So maybe she thinks he is going to recover from the throat slit. And when he does recover in his anger, he will kill Kathleen. Maybe that's what she's thinking. I don't know, what do you think? I do just think it's very weird that a mom will say to two daughters, kill him. She's fine with her daughters getting their hands dirty, but not her herself. Okay, Kathleen. So Farah does manage to say one last word because the throat slit actually has done quite a lot of damage. It severed one of the main arteries and he did manage to say one last word before he stumbled backwards um, into the bedroom, like through the door into the bedroom. And his last word is just Kathleen, but it's not Kathleen. I think he calls her Kate or Kat. Um, I can't remember his pet name for Kathleen basically. And then he stumbles back through the doorway um, into the bedroom. And then Kathleen is right there again to hand her daughter Charlotte a different knife because obviously the standing knife is not gonna do the job properly. And then she hands Linda a hammer to basically finish Farah off. Obviously all of this happens very quickly. It doesn't happen as slowly as I've just told it. But where the hell did Kathleen get a hammer from? Hmm. Suspicious, isn't it? Kind of like that hammer was there waiting. So Linda, who has the hammer, starts hitting Farah repeatedly on the head, and Charlotte, who has the knife, starts stabbing him repeatedly as well. Now, it's not quite sure what happened. Like, the two girls can't really remember exactly who started doing what first, um, because they're intoxicated and they can't quite remember, and obviously all of the adrenaline running through them, it's very cloudy, like their memory of what happened. But the autopsy showed that Farah was stabbed at least 27 times and had quite a few blunt force trauma wounds to the head, which would have been from the hammer. And I just want to preface this, that whilst the two girls are savagely murdering Farah, Kathleen is just sat on the sofa without a care in the world. So after they finish brutally murdering Farah, Charlotte and Linda start freaking out. They're like, what the hell have we just done? Like it starts to actually dawn on them. And Kathleen is just shouting, get him out. So the two girls move Farah's body into the bathroom. So they've got to get rid of this body. And what do they decide to do? Dismember him, why? So I don't know whose idea it was, but the two girls get to work on dismembering the body. And the only tools that they have to dismember the body are the knife, the bread knife. I don't think I stressed that enough, did I? It was a bread knife that Charlotte was stabbing Farah repeatedly. So she had originally slit him with um, a Stanley knife and then she had a bread knife. Um, so yeah, all they have to dismember Farah's body is the bread knife and a hammer. Bread knives aren't the sharpest knife. And once again, the two girls are dismembering the body. And where is Kathleen? In the kitchen smoking. Like, I swear, mother of the year award that one. Not that the two girls are innocent at all, but you know. So they get to work on dismembering the body and they're just like hacking away at this body with no like plan at all. They're just hacking randomly to try and break up Farah's body. And they take it in turns with the hammer, like smashing the joints and stuff. And then with the bread knife, trying to cut through bone and tissue. It's just, ugh. It took them five hours to dismember Farah's body into eight different pieces. And there was just blood everywhere. The smell. Can you imagine the smell? Linda has actually reported that the smell was horrific. And then in one final act, Linda decides to cut off Farah's penis, saying that he will not rape anybody else again. And she did this after finding out that Farah had also raped Kathleen. So after they finished dismembering Farah's body, they place the eight body parts into sports bags and just, just random different bags. And then they get onto the cleanup. And then Linda calls 
John, their father. I don't know if she was phoning him to ask for help. She did phone her dad and told him what had gone on, which he didn't believe her. I mean, why would you believe that? It's a crazy story. But Charlotte and Linda are his daughters, so he does go over. I think he's just like concerned about them. I think he probably thinks that they're on drugs, which they are, but I think he probably thinks that they're not thinking straight right now. So he heads over to the flat and when he arrives at the flat, everything is clean, everything is calm. And he's like, oh, they were joking, it's not real. But then Linda took him to the sports bags and opened the sports bags and showed him. Can you imagine? Dad, I've got something to show you. He doesn't even know what to do. He doesn't even know what to say. He actually just runs straight out of the flat and he just decides that he doesn't want anything to do with this. Count me out, I'm not doing it. I know I'm your dad, but I'm not doing anything about this. Leave me out of it. So I'm just gonna go through the timeline of the events just in case if you're a little bit confused when everything happened and everything. Um, so obviously they were out drinking on the Sunday, the 20th of March. They head back to the flat when it starts getting dark around 6 p.m. on the Sunday. The murder takes place shortly after they return. I don't know the exact time, but it's shortly after six o'clock. The dismemberment took around five hours. So we're technically on Monday now in the early hours and it's really dark outside obviously and all three of the Mull Hall women decide that this is the best time to dispose of the body parts. So the body parts are all packed up all nicely in these sports bags and they decide let's dump the body in the local canal. So when they get to the canal, they look around, make sure no one is looking, you know, even though it's the early hours of the morning, sometimes there can be nosy neighbors. And then they just open the sports bags and empty the body parts into the canal. And they stay around to make sure that the body parts sink. However, they did decide to not put two body parts into the canal and that was the head and the penis. They didn't put the head in the canal because they thought, well, if the body does get discovered, um, if there's no head, they won't be able to identify who it is. And don't ask me why they kept the penis or they kept the penis back. I don't know. And I actually don't know what they did with the penis. Don't know, maybe they just put it in the bin. <laughs> and they decide that the head needs to be far away from the body, like it needs to be in a completely different place. So they place the head in a backpack and they go to a nearby town and there's actually CCTV footage of them just walking around this town, almost window shopping at times with a backpack. That's just so creepy, isn't it? Because we know what's in that backpack. And they did have to get onto a bus to get to this local town with the head in a backpack. Imagine when you're on the bus, people have backpacks all the time. Imagine sitting by somebody that has a head in their backpack. I'm sorry, that's just too much for me. So before they actually decide what to do with the head, like where to put it, they realize that they're hungry. So they stop at like a supermarket to pick up some food. I'm sorry, I just cannot get over this. It's like, who has an appetite to eat right now? You've got a head in your backpack and you're thinking about eating? But anyway, they head to the Sean Walsh Memorial Park and this is where they decide is a good place to dispose of their head. And they decide that the best place to put this head is to bury it under a park bench. Why would anyone think that that's a good place for starters? I don't know. So they get out a knife and they just start digging away at the ground <laughs> to put this head. How nobody saw them do this, I really don't know. And if you're wondering, oh, did they bury the penis with the head? No, like I said, I don't know what happened with the penis. I don't know what they did with it. So now that they have disposed of the body parts, they're terrified that they're going to be discovered. So over the next few days after the murder, all three of them keep going back to the canal just to make sure that nothing has uh, risen to the top and nothing is visible and everything is okay. However, body parts do start to float to the surface. I don't know if they just go to that part of the canal because obviously the body parts could have gone to a different part of the canal. I don't know. And passers-by of the canal do start to notice that there are body parts in the canal but they don't believe that they're human. They kind of just thought that these body parts uh, were like mannequin parts or props, like some kind of fake body parts, you know, because 
It didn't look real. The body parts didn't look human. They had gone like a funny color. But then 10 days after the murder, a foot, well, a leg had floated to the top and this leg had the foot attached and there was a sock on the foot. Now there was just something about the way this leg looked. It clearly maybe looked a little bit more real, but the person that spotted the leg thought, I need to phone the guardy about this. I need to report this. So that's exactly what they did. So the guardy arrive and they're like, holy crap, this is not a mannequin. This is not um, a prop. This is a human leg. So because there is this human leg, they think maybe the rest of the body is in the canal as well. So they get a diving team down to try and fish out the rest of the body parts, which obviously they do. They find all eight body parts, which is a complete human body, um, except the head and the penis. Now, as you can imagine, finding a body in a canal is gonna cause mayhem with the media, which obviously it did. The media was all over this. There was so much public attention. And what is the craziest bit about this is that there's footage of the canal and there's a little bridge over the canal and there's two women stood on the canal bridge. Guess who it is? Linda and Charlotte. I can't believe it. It's like when the news was reporting on this crime, the two murderers are in the footage, in the news footage. So initially the police thought that this was some kind of ritual killing because the penis was missing and because there was a similar killing to this, like a dismemberment and things missing in London. So they thought maybe these two are connected, but they can't identify the body. So they do release the images to the media in hopes that someone will recognize something because the body still had clothes on it. So because the body parts had now been found in the canal, Linda is freaking out and she starts to panic about the head because she thinks if they find this head, they're obviously going to know who it is and then it's going to lead right back to Linda, Charlotte and Kathleen. So she starts panicking about the head. So what does she do? She goes back to the head and she doesn't just go back to the head. She digs the head up. So when she digs the head up, she says a prayer over the head. She apologizes to Farah, I assume, for what she's done. And then she says that he didn't deserve this and that it should have been her mom instead, um, which I found really interesting. Uh, I don't quite know what she means by that. Like it should have been her mom instead. Like, does she mean that it should have been her mom that was murdered? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so. You never know. Or does she mean that it should be her mom like suffering, dealing with this? Because it does seem like Kathleen is leaving all of the dirty work and the stress and everything to her daughters. Um, so after she says the prayer over the head and uh, apologizes, what does she go and do? She smashes up the head. <sighs> and she did take a full bottle of vodka with her to drink. So it gave her the courage to do this because Linda was really suffering from this. From what I've researched on this case and what I know, Linda was really struggling. Linda really regretted what she had done. There are a couple of conflicting stories about Linda and what she did with the smashed up head pieces. One story is that she took the head pieces and put them into different bins around the park. And then the other story is that she took the head pieces and buried the pieces in a nearby field. But still to this day, the head has not been found. So not much happens when the body parts are found because like the police, um, the guardy, I keep getting confused, um, can't identify the body. But six weeks after the leg was found, so after the body was found, one of Farah's friends is reading an article in a paper about the murder and the pictures are in the paper and he sees the t-shirt that was found on the torso. And he's like, I recognize that t-shirt. That is the t-shirt that Farah was wearing the last time. I saw him, which was at the St. Patrick's Day celebrations. So Farah's friend tried to phone up Farah just to see like, hey, you okay, you know? Um, and Farah didn't answer. So Farah's friend reports this to the guardy and the guardy obviously look into every tip that they get, but this one kind of just made sense to them. So they managed to track down one of Farah's children, get the DNA from that child and see if it's a match to the body and voila, it is. So of course, because they now know the identity of the body, it doesn't take the police long to 
find the connection to the Mulhall women. And all three of them deny having anything to do with the murder. At first, they're like, mm -mm, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But the police do arrest all three of them on suspicion of murder. But because they're all denying it and they're not saying anything, and the police, other than their suspicion, they don't have any concrete evidence at the time that they did commit the murder, they have to let them go. However, a couple of weeks after the initial arrest, Linda again is struggling. She can't cope with the guilt. She does go back to the guardy and she confesses everything. She tells them everything. So after Linda's confession, they go to the flat, they search the flat and they end up finding Farah's DNA everywhere. I mean, of course, the mess that was made after dismembering. Um, they find like traces of blood and stuff, which is enough to arrest Charlotte, Linda and Kathleen. So obviously already got Linda, they arrest her, they go and arrest Charlotte, but when they go and arrest Kathleen, she's nowhere to be found. She's done a runner and the police can't find her, but um, we'll get back to that in a minute. And as you can imagine, due to the nature of this crime, uh, there was huge media interest in the sisters, in the crime, and this is when the two sisters were given the name the Scissor Sisters. It's not really known exactly why they were called the Scissor Sisters because there are no scissors involved whatsoever. So if you were expecting there to be some scissors involved and that's why they're called the Scissor Sisters, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but they're not. I assume they're called the Scissor Sisters because they cut up a body and the Scissor Sisters obviously is a catchy name. Yeah, it has nothing to do with scissors or the band. So Linda and Charlotte are both charged with murder of Farah, but they both plead not guilty to that on the defense of provocation, which means that they're basically not denying that they killed Farah, but they're saying that it's not murder because they were provoked into killing him. So they want the charge to be lowered to manslaughter. However, Charlotte was found guilty of murder and she was sentenced to life in prison. However, Linda's defense of provocation actually succeeded. Her conviction was lowered to manslaughter and she was given uh, 15 years in prison. And I don't know why Linda's plea of provocation was successful and Charlotte's wasn't. I'm guessing it's because Farah actually had his hands on Linda and was being inappropriate and God knows what he actually intended to do with Linda. That doesn't really make sense to me because it's like if your sister is being sexually assaulted, is that not enough to be provoked into some kind of action. But Linda also fully cooperated with the investigation. She also showed remorse for the crime. And I think both of those also helped in Linda getting a lesser sentence. So finally, in February 2008, two and a half years after she went on the run, Kathleen is finally located. It turns out that she was actually here in England just kind of living her life. She dyed her hair blonde, she changed her last name and she was just living off benefits. So when Kathleen finally returned, uh, she faced multiple charges, which included impeding an arrest, because obviously she ran away, giving false information about Farah's whereabouts, also giving false information that would have led to the arrest of both Linda and Charlotte, and also cleaning up the crime scene. And for all of this, she was found guilty, but she only received five years in prison. I'm sorry, what? Five years? I think anyway, she should have gotten way more than five years. I think the police were even surprised about how little she got. Now, this is just my opinion, but I believe that Kathleen played a way bigger role in this case than what we know of. I mean, she was abused for years, so she definitely had the motive to kill Farah. It was definitely a stronger motive for Kathleen to kill Farah than her two daughters anyway. And I feel like just the fact that she was just so calm through the whole thing, like she just sat on the sofa while her daughters murdered her boyfriend. I just have a sneaky little suspicion that this murder may have been planned. And I just feel like just because Kathleen herself didn't murder Farah and apparently she didn't help in the dismemberment, but who knows? I just feel like she's the one pulling the strings, you know? So fast forward to today, both Linda and Kathleen have been released from prison. Uh, Charlotte is still serving her sentence. And from what I've read, Charlotte is definitely causing a bit of trouble in prison. And it's not likely that she is going to be released 
anytime soon. And Charlotte now hates her sister, uh, Linda, because Linda got a lesser sentence than her. And Charlotte claims that Linda played a bigger role than her. So why did she get more in prison than her sister? She also hates the name Scissor Sisters because it implies that she's a monster, which she's not. And Linda also doesn't talk to her mom. Basically, all three of them don't like each other. And there's also one final tragedy that happened in this case. So Linda and Charlotte's dad, John Mulhall, did tragically take his own life. He did hang himself in a park in December of 2000. And five after Linda confessed to the crimes. So for me, I can't quite work out if this murder was planned or not. I keep flip-flopping back and forth. Obviously, this is all speculation. We don't know. It could have been a sudden attack. We could actually just know the story. But I don't think it's too far-fetched to believe that Farah was sexually inappropriate with both Linda and possibly Charlotte on multiple occasions prior to this night. And we obviously know that he raped Kathleen. So I don't think it's too far-fetched to believe that all three women kind of got together and were like, we're not having this anymore. We need to do something about it. And, you know, kind of plan to kill him, you know? And it's just the way that Kathleen hands her daughters the knife and the hammer. Like it's just all planned, thought out. And just the way that Kathleen was just so calm about the whole situation. Like she already knew what was gonna happen because it was planned. Of course, it could have been a sudden attack. I don't know, do I? They were all intoxicated and this would have definitely affected their mind and how they went about things. But I kind of think it was planned. <laughs> I just keep going back to that conversation that Kathleen had with one of Farah's exes, where she said, if you don't get away from him, he is gonna kill you. So maybe Maybe Kathleen thought that killing him was the only way she was going to get free. Um, but instead of her doing it herself, she left her daughters to do it for her. Um, but I don't know. That's just all speculation. We don't know. But let me know what you think about this case. Let me know. Do you think it was planned? Do you think it was a sudden attack? Leave me all of your thoughts and opinions down below. Uh, let me know what other cases you want me to cover as well. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye. And yes, I did do a green look because we did an Irish case, okay?